Let's big rock. round of applause Good. once again for our presenter. I just Nicholas, wanted a second one. Nicholas Cruz. <laughs> All right, so first I hope you will pardon my French. Uh, I will try to uh, be uh, really clear and speak slowly. Um, my name is Nicolas Bruce. I'm a director of operation engineering at uh, Tumogul. Um, if you saw my talk last year and the year before, some of the slides may seem similar. I will go really quickly on all the first parts, but uh, I will try to cover uh, what we do and how we work with Nagios uh, at Tumogul how we uh, use uh, Nagios to monitor uh, multiple uh, geolocation. And very quickly, I will try to present how we try to solve the big problem that most operation uh, team has, uh, which is like trying to solve the problem that is important to the business uh, instead of just trying to uh, remove some bad data on a big server that nobody cares. Uh, so I will try to cover all this uh, point uh, as best as I can. Um, so first, a quick overview about Tumogul. Uh, I won't go in details. Uh, I'm in engineering, not in sales. But to give you an idea on our business, um, Tumogul is in uh, real-time bidding video advertisement. If you go in, uh, on YouTube to see a video, before this video, you may have uh, um, what's happened in real-time. Google is going to contact a bunch of partners and ask, like, oh, we have this user on, uh, on this uh, page going to see this video. Uh, and is this cookie? Do you want to show him an, an ad? And a bunch of partners are going to say like, oh yeah, I want this user, uh, I have an ad that he would like, uh, and I'm ready to pay like 10 cents or 15 cents for that. Um, so it's the real-time bidding part of this process. And whoever wins, whoever has the biggest auction, will have his ad displayed, and that's the 15 second, 30 second uh, pre-roll ad that you will see on YouTube, and after that you can see your video. Um, the one you like is probably coming from us because we do really good user targeting. <laughs> uh, the one you don't like is probably our competitor. Uh, so that's a high level overview of our business. Um, that's, that's what that means for us in operation, that we have to uh, monitor between like 800 and 1,000 servers, uh, depending on the traffic load period of the year and things like that. Um, we, we have servers across six different locations. Um, for Amazon EC2 region, uh, pretty much 99% of our infrastructure is on Amazon uh, as of today. Uh, we have some servers uh, and database in uh, a Nosted provider called Liquid Web in Michigan, and uh, we have some in uh, Linode, uh, which is actually just two or three servers on Linode. Um, we have uh, little monitoring resources, but we do collect uh, about uh, 120,000 uh, matrix with uh, ganglia and graphite. Uh, we monitor over 20,000 services with Nagios. And uh, our platform has to handle like over, um, actually it's about 10 billion HTTP uh, a day. Uh, and the important part of that is because it's real-time bidding, all those uh, requests have to be answered in less than, uh, in average, 100 milliseconds. With some partner like Google, it will be 90 milliseconds. This includes network on trip and processing time. So it, it forces us to be smart on the way we design the application and also how we react to uh, outage or issue or how we do maintenance because it can easily impact our uh, performance on our business. Uh, and uh, especially if we lost traffic, that means for us not necessarily loss of money, but uh, depending on which part of the platform is impacted, but that do mean like loss of business, uh, which is really bad for us advertising company. Um, so we have about 80 different server profiles. What that means is that we don't have just like 800 uh, Apache web frontend. Uh, we have a lot of different uh, server. Our stack is mm, uh, based off a Java application with uh, embedded uh, JT. We have some Tomcat. Uh, we have a web frontend in PHP. We have some uh, Ruby on Rails API. Uh, we have a lot of Hadoop uh, technology, so we have HDFS, uh, MapReduce, uh, HBase, Hive. Uh, we have some uh, CouchBase uh, cluster in each of our region. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with CouchBase, but it's basically a, a clustering solution for Memcache. Uh, and it's for us, it's really important to have this kind of solution in memory solution. It allows us to uh, access our huge cookie database in less than uh, 4 milliseconds. 
uh, when our database answer in more than 10 milliseconds, it's generally bad for us. Uh, we start to have timeout and can't answer to a bidding uh, option um, uh, fast enough. Uh, we have MySQL, Vertica. Uh, we uh, start to have some elastic search uh, for different uh, uh, search across all our campaign and things like that. Uh, and we start to use it also for centralized logging uh, with Logstash. Our monitoring is based on uh, Nagios, and we use heavily NSCA. Uh, we graph with uh, Ganglia, Islo, Graphite. Um, we are trying to get uh, more and more of Islo implemented. We had our time, and we didn't totally do the full move with that. We are still heavily uh, running just on uh, Gmetad or Gmetric. Uh, we have all our Java applications that use uh, J metrics or something like that, the Java um, uh, wrapper for uh, Ganglia. Uh, so we can uh, expose every of our G GMX uh, metrics to Ganglia and graph pretty much everything the application needs. Uh, it's really important to uh, give the developers this uh, power to graph what they need, because as operation, we don't necessarily know what they are developing, uh, what they are building, and how it's supposed to work. So we, we can't tell if something goes down um, if it's because there is too much traffic or how we should do capacity planning and, and why, why uh, X or Y, Z. I mean, it's really important for the developer to give us this visibility and tell us how we can efficiently like, uh, provision the infrastructure and how we can uh, get this kind of uh, information. So we expose all that to the developer and they can do it like, uh, on their own without relying on us. Uh, configuration management, we use Puppet. So if you're not familiar with Amazon uh, Cloud Environment, uh, it's really simple. And I, I guess in 2013, pretty much everyone knows how it works. Uh, there is multiple region, uh, which is uh, a geographical region. Uh, so you will have US East, Europe West, uh, you will have US West, uh, APAC. Uh, they have like different geographical regions. In those regions, they have different availability zones, which is basically different data centers. So uh, I know in Sil Silicon Valley, they will have like uh, three or four different data centers. Uh, in Virginia, in U uh, US East, they will have, uh, I think they have four uh, data centers, and each of them has a different naming. And uh, you can uh, access, I mean, they call that a VBT zone, basically. Um, so what we use on Amazon, we use uh, EC2, SDB, SQS, EMR, S3, uh, I probably forgot uh, SNS, SES, uh, a, a lot of things is getting bigger and bigger. Uh, we don't use ELB uh, for a simple reason. Uh, it doesn't work for us. Um, we have to respond in a really short uh, latency. Uh, ELB doesn't scale well uh, to a traffic, uh, to a spike. Uh, so you will have to take like 10, 15 minutes before like your uh, ELB will be uh, scaling properly. And it's not acceptable for us to lose traffic or uh, respond like 503 or 504. We can have our partners that totally cut the traffic. Um, and the latency aspect is really important for us. Um, we heavily use uh, EC2 tags. Uh, so it allows us to uh, uh, give host name or profile, or we can define like which Nagio host the instance is supposed to report. When we start the instance, Puppet can look at this tag and say, like, oh, OK, I configure your uh, passive monitoring uh, to report to this host. And I can, uh, uh, this way, it can e easily allow us to distribute the, um, the monitoring and the load across like multiple uh, Nagios, because we are still on uh, 3.2 or 3.5, something like that. Um, so not yet in 4. And uh, we don't have like Worker, Modgerman, and things like that. So. So that's the high-level overview. So you will see that um, we have each availability zone, each region that we monitor. Um, on each of them, we have uh, one or more Nagios instance, one or more uh, Ganglia and Graphite servers. Uh, each servers in this uh, zone will report passive check, or we will have also like active check coming from Nagios, depending on what we are monitoring. We try to limit the number of active check and uh, leverage as much as we can I mean, passive check just because it's scaled better for us. Uh, we may revisit that with uh, Nagios 4 if it's really, that's much better. So we'll see. Um, 
And what's happened is uh, we have this uh, instance on uh, Linode that is just there to tell us if our Nagios monitoring in each region is working. So when we spin up a new uh, Nagios instance somewhere, uh, we make sure it gets registered in our Linode and it just tells us like, hey, okay, you have your monitoring working in this zone. Um, if it goes down or if there is network connectivity issues, we get paged. Uh, but if it's just a network connectivity issues, we still have all our check here that are working and we know like, okay, it's just a, um, some network problem or Amazon problem or just something related to the uh, connectivity between Linode and Amazon. Um, yes, that's and Liquid Web is reporting to uh, the Nagios to a Linode, just separate environment too. Uh, the big things we do for graphing, we use a federated graphite. So we have one instance that just takes care to uh, pull data from every of our other instance. Uh, we can easily do uh, aggregated graph without having to centralize all the RD files or all the metrics we collect. Um, we try to collect everything in one instance because we're like, oh yeah, but if there's network issues and things like that, how do I look at my graph? There's network issue, actually, we don't really care about the graph. We try to figure out the problem first. Um, the we really found like graphs are really useful for us for capacity planning or, or understanding what some uh, odd behavior. Uh, but when there is an active issue, Nagios is generally the tool that reports the issue. Um, so federated graphite is, has been working well for us. Uh, we had to patch it to support SSL, uh, but uh, really useful to uh, build aggregated graph without like having bigger sync and uh, moving all your data around. So uh, I will go quickly on this one. Uh, basically the process, we start an instance with a tool we call uh, Cerveza. Uh, my Spanish accent is as good as I can. Uh, we also use uh, Cloudinit. Um, so the idea of Cerveza is basically like we can use this tool to provision, we just start the command we can just get for a beer and it will take care of everything for us. Um, we still get the beer, but we still watch the command going. Uh, it, it's not always uh, working well. There's always like dependencies with Amazon when uh, EBS doesn't detach correctly or doesn't attach correctly or stuff like that. Uh, but uh, working well so far. Uh, we leverage Claudine to push all our uh, puppet uh, uh, configuration and uh, at this point when the instance is up with the right uh, device, IP, uh, host name, uh, all these things and uh, Puppet is configured. Then Puppet take, uh, take over. Uh, it configures Gmond, uh, Gmond, Sflow or whatever we want. Uh, it will take care of installing uh, software or Java or whatever uh, will be uh, relevant to this instance. Um, so yeah, we have, um, I'm not sure what I mean by this third one, but basically uh, <laughs> um, all instance will start reporting automatically a graph and metrics to our centralized uh, ganglia and graphite uh, because it will be configured to a German. What we used to do in the past, we were basing our Nagios configuration based on those uh, uh, metrics collected by ganglia. Because the Nagios host was running on the same host as Ganglia, uh, we could lo just look at the RD file coming up and like, oh, there's a new host that just showed up. So it was kind of for uh, automatic discovery of the instance we are starting. Um, there was some issue with that. It was not perfect. We are still having like a, what we call zombie host, some host that didn't start totally correctly, but was starting to send uh, metrics. Uh, we are having issues when we shut down host. Uh, we still have uh, like all those metrics around and still trying to get, uh, still getting alert from Nagios. So we had to remove them manually. So we, uh, last year we um, started to uh, use the EC2 API uh, to um, generate our Nagios configuration, uh, which has been like much more useful. It can look at whatever is running in the specific region, look at this Nagios tag we have on the instance, and figure out like, okay, I'm this Nagios host, uh, I have to monitor this instance, I will generate a config, and based on the host name and the group uh, of this uh, host, it will figure out in which host group uh, it needs to belong. And then we have all those configs are managed by Puppet, and the host specific config are uh, generated um, automatically by this uh, uh, check team cluster, as we call it, that look at EC2. 
so if a new host is found, we build a config uh, based on a template. Uh, we just do some string replace, and then we, we just reload. Uh, we rebuild the cache, and we reload the uh, Nigeros. Um, this script checking for what is running on EC2 is actually a Nigeros check. So we have like Nigeros running this check and looking like, oh, OK, I have new host. I should rebuild my config, test the config. Does it work? No? OK, I, uh, I send an alert. If the config is fine, it will uh, do the reload. So it, it was a way for us, because we could have done the cron tab, but we would have like difficulties to make sure um, we don't run too many reload. This way, we really make sure that Nagios finished to run all the tests it needs and get in the same uh, run uh, before adding new config. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry for that. Uh, anyway, if we find zombie hosts, so if it's us that are not referenced correctly or are terminated or things like that, we can generate alerts. We also have alerts if uh, an instance is degraded or going to be shut down by, uh, by uh, Amazon, uh, things like that. Um, so if the config is corrupt, uh, it won't restart Nagios, but it will uh, page us. Um, it generally doesn't happen unless we uh, change something in Puppet and created a bad group somewhere. Um, anyway, uh, one thing we do, because we have a lot uh, of servers, we uh, try to reduce the noise. Uh, so we basically disable like notification on most check, and we use what we call a check cluster service. Uh, if you saw uh, Etsy uh, talk yesterday, um, they, they have this check called check check. It's pretty much doing the same. It's going to uh, follow some regex and some alerts and say like, okay, on this 100 host, uh, is, it, is everything done or is it just one? And we can put thresholds, say like, OK, I'm worried if 20% uh, of my cluster is reporting like bad ping or bad latency or disk full or whatever. If we just have one going bad, uh, it may be a one-off. Because it's Amazon, it may be because there is some other VM running on the same host that are interfering with us. So we really don't care on each specific host. I don't want to get paid on every of the 800 servers we run. But I do want to know if my cluster uh, else is uh, if my cluster is healthy. So it's what we use for. Uh, so we have this uh, check Nigel status that just basically, uh, based on uh, host regex and service regex, we look at the number of warning critical or unknown. So we can have like specific check around that. Um, it's based on the status dot that. So I guess in Nigel's four, maybe we'll try to uh, look at the JSON uh, things instead of the status dot that, or maybe the query handler. Um, we have the check Nigel status message, which is a really useful one, actually. Um, because we give possibility to our engineering team to create all the alerts they want, they will have alerts that we don't necessarily care, but in some case, the critical they do uh, will be something that is relevant to us. So we can, if they send a critical and it's just an application related, but at one point it's say like, oh, there was a database connection issue, we can just uh, have message filters, so we'll just have some regex and try to look for this. And in our case, it will page us only in the specific case when the message is uh, matching this regex. So it will be like, um, it will allow us to have more actionable al alerts in our, uh, on our team, uh, instead of being, uh, having a lot of alerts that are noisy and we don't know how to uh, react to it because it's too uh, depending on the application itself. So. Uh, next things we do, so we reduce the noise, we try to um, have an efficient on-call rotation. So the big things we introduced, uh, it has been a challenge, but uh, we are working on follow the sun strategy. So we have an ops team in Ukraine. Uh, if you guys uh, work as, as worked in the Silicon Valley, you know that the engineering market here is really tough. It's hard to hire uh, good people, uh, especially if you want to look at uh, skills, culture fit, uh, all those things. It's a really, uh, th there is so many uh, big guys there. There is like Google, LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, everyone is hiring hard. Everyone is trying to negotiate like free lunch. Uh, it's, it's really hard for a startup like us to uh, just compete with that. Um, and uh, second, so when you say to people, to engineer, like, hey, you have to be on call at night, that's an, that, that's get even tougher for us to hire uh, people. So um, we built this team in Ukraine. 
uh, is working really well, really well for us, and it really allows us to have a 24-7 coverage, and also to review the way we work. We try to be like uh, smarter uh, on the way we manage um, all our alerting and monitoring, how we pass the information, our team is growing. That's one of our challenge. Uh, it really forces us to have like proper documentation, cross-training, uh, which is helping us to get progressively to a better uh, uh, disaster recovery plan. So if uh, tomorrow we have like a, a connective issue in, in uh, California or an earthquake or whatever, we know we have a team in Ukraine that can take over. Uh, so all those things, we don't necessarily think about it as a startup, but uh, having this team in Ukraine really help us to get there and do a bit uh, more efficient work and really think about uh, how we make actionable um, alert because the team in Ukraine doesn't necessarily communicate or is uh, in direct contact every day with the engineering team and know, uh, oh, I just released something like five minutes ago, hope it will go well. Uh, we need to have like better process in place and that, that's really helped us to do that. Uh, time period uh, and escalation are a pain to maintain in Nagios. You probably all try to do that when you start to have like uh, six people on call or seven people on call. It's, it's it's really hard to maintain that. If you have different schedule, it's not flexible. You have to change your config reload everywhere when you have like eight or nine Nagios running. Uh, it's, it gets annoying, painful, and, and uh, prone to errors. Uh, so we plugged um, last year, something like that, we plugged around Nagios notification to a Google Calendar. Uh, I think there was a talk about some people like uh, two days ago plugging their Nagios to a SharePoint. Uh, so we don't need a FTP server in our case. We just use a Google API. We just look at uh, Google Calendar. We can uh, figure out like who is tier one, who is tier two, who is tier three. Um, when you're on call, we can generate some uh, local cache. So if we have like connectivity issues to uh, Google, um, it, it's not a problem. We still have like uh, on-call information. It allows us to have like simpler definition on the Nagios contact. We don't have to have like crazy time period definition and get things messed up. Uh, and we really notify only, um, only people who are on call. Um, so that looks like, I mean, Google can die. It makes it really easy to manage. You just do your event, say like, hey, you're on call these things. It's much easier than figuring out like time period and stuff like that. And we can even schedule maintenance. Uh, we have like different calendar for different team. Uh, that will look like this. Uh, in the Nigeria's uh, contact config. So we just have our specific um, notification. So we use a pager contact. Uh, we have the pager line that is uh, um, email or a SMS that you will use. The Google Calendar ID uh, that uh, Nagios uh, or notification plugin will uh, need to look at uh, to figure out if you are on call or not. Uh, the filtering uh, things that we use. Uh, and what kind of interval you want. So if you are tier three, what uh, do you want to be notified after like 30 minutes tier two didn't reply or do you want to be notified after like five hours or something like that. So um, that's the kind of things we can do. And of course email is just a way to say like, okay, no matter what, I want to get every notification by email, even if it's not an important one. Um, so that's help us. Another thing we did, uh, this year, actually, it's a centralized dashboard. It really helps uh, the on-call team to be more efficient. Uh, so we can uh, visualize really quickly all the different teams. See, like, okay, who is tier one, who is tier two, uh, who is on-call, what is the phone number? It's always a pain when you have to look like for 15 minutes or half an hour, like, what, what's the phone number of this guy again? So you have everything in one dashboard. You can really quickly like escalate to a whoever is, is in charge. And it's happened a lot in operation team when you have some problem, you know something is wrong, you know there was a release the day before, but you don't know how to fix it. And so the first thing you will have to do is contacting like whoever did this release or whoever in this team is in charge to try to help you like, oh, we did change this, it may put more load on these services or things like that. So um, it, it's really helpful for us to figure out like who we need to contact. Um, and you can see, like, depending on the teams, it, not everyone has tier three. Uh, it's mostly operations that has a tier three. Uh, it's a 24 7 tier three, actually. Um, the other things we have centralized view of uh, multiple Nagios. So this one is really useful. I, it has been a pain to connect in like 
10 different managers trying to follow emails, paging, and stuff like that. So we summarize everything in this view. Um, we can see like each uh, Nagios instance we have, even the dev instance. We can see what kind of alert is paging. So in red, that will be the actual active uh, paging alert that has not been acknowledged and are still firing. Uh, in uh, gray, it's all the, num it's the number of alerts in our config that are uh, marked as paging, but are, sti are OK. Critical, that will be the same thing. It's like number of critical alerts going on, but it's not a paging alert. So it may be like, oh, OK, disk usage and the MySQL server start to be really bad, uh, thing like that. So it's not necessarily something we want to be paged. We have people 24 seven, so it's just like a routine maintenance or monitoring and we need to uh, act. Um, but it's not something we want to be wake up or like it's six in the morning, you don't necessarily want to, uh, uh, to be paged. Um, and the gray part is the same thing, it's like number of, uh, it's actually in critical, it's the number of uh, uh, critical alerts that has, uh, total critical alert and in red is a total critical alert that has not been acknowledged. Uh, warning, unknown, we don't show the OK alert because we really don't care if things work, things work, we are not going to look for that. Uh, we have like about 20,000 checks, so it's, it doesn't help us to know that. And we check uh, when was the last time we updated this information. Um, this dashboard is updated from the status.dat. We have some uh, cron job looking at that on each Nigeria and push this information to our dashboard. Um, it's not necessarily super efficient, but we really have like a, a, a good visibility in a one, two minutes uh, time range. Uh, we are pretty sure it's relevant. And uh, if it's not, after five or 10 minutes, this last update become red and tell us like, hey, you didn't get like a really uh, good update on this dashboard, so we can look at what's going on. Uh, that's really helpf helpful for us to drive our on call and our operation, so we know what what we should prioritize, like paging and critical, and try to work on that. Uh, you can see when we click on one of those information, we can get some details. So we know, like, okay, what what was the host? What is the status? What was the last check? Is it like a, a hard error or a soft error? What was the status information? We have a link directly to the Nigeria instance if we want to acknowledge. Um, and we can also we also have like some uh, another tab that tell us like the notification summary. Uh, that's something useful because we always have someone that will come to us and say like, oh no, I didn't get page. Well, let me check. And uh, we, we can see like who is being paged and who is uh, getting the alert or not. And uh, it's kind of useful to keep people accountable, but also to know like uh, who you want to get in touch with and see like who, who is working, could be working on the issue. So that's one of the tools we have. Um, when you click on the uh, on this list of uh, alerts uh, here, for example, oops, sorry, uh, I believe on the warning one, for example, uh, you will have the ability to see like um, to create ticket uh, based on the status of the seller, uh, thing like that. It's not working actually. It's something we are implementing. We want to have like an easy way to create ticket in our Jira uh, uh, ticketing system. All our engineering team used Jira, so we had to, uh, I will get on that a little bit later. Um, but we, we try to simplify that for uh, on-call uh, rotation too. So now that we know what is breaking, the big question, and you saw it on this uh, dashboard, there was a lot of alert, a lot of critical, a lot of things going on. So which one should I fix first? That's a big question. Like, we, we may have like the best alerting system, monitoring and all that, and trying to filter the alerts. When there is two or three alerts going on or, or more, how do you know which one is important? So we did another dashboard. Um, and this one is really a business focus. Um, we have this idea of service uh, that tell us like what is the business services. And it's really like, uh, it's, it's pretty much part of our uh, it's really a part of our product or how our product works. So uh, our customer or salespeople, we know what these words mean and they know like what, what uh, our critical it is. We can define like specific SLA for each of those services. Uh, so we can quickly see like, oh, okay, we are out of SLA on these things. We really need to work on that and focus our effort. So 
A service represents a business critical function. A service can be global or limited to a region. You can see that we have like multiple tabs that for APAC region, for Europe, uh, for the global infrastructure. Uh, so we will have like service for each of those. Uh, they may have like different requirements and we may have different services uh, depending on the region. Um, a service is uh, defined by a service component. Uh, so we currently use mostly a NIGOS event handler uh, to update service comp uh, component status, but it's all based on a REST API. Uh, so we can easily plug like, uh, we currently start to plug like some QA test to validate like data are good. Because one of our problems is that if we start to have uh, to change the algorithm for machine learning or for uh, how we uh, decrypt, dec decrypt, sorry, or, or uh, convert uh, currencies, uh, pricing when we do an ad with partners, uh, all the pricing is encrypted if we don't get the good return. Uh, it's hard for us as an operation team to detect to see that. It's like purely application things. Um, currency conversion, same thing. It's really hard for us to know like. Uh, are we doing the good conversion of the currency? Um, so we have QA tests going on. We start to have more and more of those that will tell us like the application is running as it's expected and tell us a good uh, report. And those tests is, are plugged to our dashboard. And it doesn't need to have Nagios for it. It will, uh, it's a separate check uh, that can just report and use the REST API uh, to update this dashboard. So we can really aggregate information from different source, not just Nagios. Um, because Nagios is very really centric to a pure operation or, um, or really a, like a binary approach, like it's working, it's not working. Uh, we can have like more relevant tests going on uh, that are um, more complex and uh, still report to this da dashboard and tell us like something is off. Um, we can define service SLA and quickly see like if we are breaking an SLA somewhere. Uh, each service component, we, we are starting to introduce uh, we still use the wording like SLA for each service component or for each alert, but we are starting to introduce uh, uh, operational level agreements, so OLE, uh, which are necessary to build a valid SLA. Uh, so we start to uh, think about um, implementing that more efficiently in this dashboard, uh, which will help us to make sure like, okay, I need to fix this database because if it's not fixed in 30 minutes, in 40 minutes, I will have my SLA uh, breaking. And that's really what we are getting to. It's really trying to uh, get the right visibility on in which order we need to fix problem. Um, based on this dashboard, we can also like easily uh, perform like a bunch of action. Uh, we can uh, post comment, link to Jira ticket, uh, stuff like that. So yeah, that's the action tab. So when you are an operation people, you will have all this list when you are not an operation people, you are just a sales. You basically just see the status and service. Uh, you can go to the service component status, but uh, we will probably remove that because most people don't care on the details. They want to know if the business is working or not. Um, but in our case, it's interesting to see, like, uh, to get the detail. Uh, so what it will look like is that we'll get, like, all the components that we are testing. So we can see, like, for the website, we have a cluster name cached. Uh, check, which is a Nigel's check based on the uh, check cluster uh, plugin I talked uh, earlier. This check is uh, looking at all our memcache servers that we use uh, for the website and try to see like which one is working or not. Uh, depending on the status, it will return like warning or critical and it will impact the, um, the overall service. We know that if we lose a memcache uh, service, we probably lost some PHP session. We keep all our session in memcache. Uh, so it probably impacts customers, so we will have a performance issue. Um, we, we kind of took the bad wording of Amazon. When something goes wrong on Amazon, I don't know if you went on the status uh, page of Amazon, they generally say there is a performance issue or performance degradation. They don't say they have an outage. It's always good. Um, and, and it's pretty really rare. I think the last time they got a service interruption or, or something like that, it was a... Um, it was last year when they got a poor outage in US East. And I believe even for a couple of hours, it was just like service uh, performance issue or something like that. So it's, it's kind of confusing if you, be, you, you work on that and try to figure out what's going on on Amazon. Uh, everything is always fine. It's just like, just minor outage. You still don't have access to any of your instance, but it's, it's fine. <laughs> uh, 
So uh, we kind of took the same wording. I'm not sure we'll keep it. We can personalize that based on different check and different service. We can also put comment. Um, so that's what it looked like. Uh, we can get uh, history. Uh, so we can see like um, this, uh, this for this service, we got like oh, one component that went in warning at uh, um, 7 p.m. on September 7, and then it recovered at 8. Um, and uh, at 1 a.m. on the 9, we got another component that went down, and it recovered at 1.47. Uh, at 7.37 a.m., it went down again. So this is useful because it can really help us to figure out like small uh, instability and do a post analysis. Uh, all that is stored in a database, so we, we plan to start to have like a deeper report and more analysis on what's going on and try to identify like uh, unstable part of the infrastructure. Uh, we have SLA history, so the same way we'll keep like uh, a, uh, SLA information uh, for each of those components and we'll know like, okay, well this uh, full user DB things uh, on the 16 was out of SLA for 100 minutes. So uh, that's bad. Uh, luckily it's more like an OLA, uh, more than a SLA, it's not the service SLA at this point. Um, but uh, it's really important for us to understand how much we uh, we want over what we commit to do. Um, it really gives us like good visibility, understand how we impact the business. Um, so when something goes wrong, we can just go on one of these uh, services and create a Jira ticket. We have this simple interface. Uh, it will uh, take everything from Nagios or from whatever uh, input you give to the REST API. Uh, when it's a Nigeria, we just give everything, all the message from Nigeria with all the information we can. Uh, but you can easily just create a ticket. And I will explain why it's important for us in a few seconds. Um, you can get some reporting. Uh, so you, you can uh, get uh, state history, SLA history, um, based on time range, so if you want to see like how you did like last last uh, week or last uh, month or last quarter, it's easy to clear up the form, export to CSV if you want, uh, and uh, look at the full history of all the alert firing. Uh, and we do the same for SLA, we have like full report. Uh, so, no. Know that we have this tool, it's nice, but like all those tools, if we don't update it correctly, if we don't put the right information, it's going to be useless. So how do we make sure uh, uh, we answer the business need and what we are showing is relevant? Uh, we are starting to do like to review all this SLA information and moni monitoring configuration monthly and quarterly. Uh, we are working in a fast-paced environment. We are still a startup, even if we uh, in five years, we went from like seven people to uh, 204 people, something like that. Uh, there is a lot of challenge, like people, uh, communication challenge, growth. Uh, um, so we try to review that. Uh, it's not easy. There is a lot of things. There is a lot of alerts. We also introduce uh, a checklist. So we provide that to our product managers that will make sure like um, Every engineer, when they start a project, they look at this checklist and answer all those questions. One of those questions is like, um, I mean, there is a lot. I mean, it's a five-page uh, uh, form. I, it's really not complicated. It's just like, okay, who is the lead on this project? Uh, what is the main uh, ticket in GR? Uh, where is the documentation if we need it? Um, uh, what, what about backup? What about capacity planning? Do we need monitoring? Do we need database access? Uh, do you need like uh, S3 access? Do you need uh, all those things uh, are really important for us because we it, it helps us to plan better on the long term and give like proper uh, resources and help uh, to our engineering team so they can keep moving fast. But the important one is also like uh, about capacity planning. How we should be able? How do we know like if we have like a, if it's just like. A, um, traffic growth because of the business or if it's because like someone, uh, a product manager or, or whatever decide to um, to add a new partner, but we don't use this partner, but it's still introduced like uh, uh, 5,000 requests per second more on our uh, infrastructure. Uh, it, it has a business impact because that means we will have like more cost on our infrastructure, but it doesn't bring business. So we want to make sure to understand like who, 
who can um, impact the traffic, the storage. If you choose to store, like to stop storing your uh, cookie information for from 30 days to 60 days, it's going to double the size of your cookie database probably. So who makes this decision and why? Uh, how how uh, pertinent is it? Is what we try to answer with this question. And um, we also ask about like uh, uh, operational level agreement and service level agreement. We discover frequently like people have some assumption like, oh yeah, we have a SLA of 24 hours on that. Okay, that may be good. And you talk with the QA or people who are in charge of all those SLAs, they're like, oh no, I'm not aware about that. And then you talk to business people. Oh no, I, we don't need about this. We don't have any SLA on this. And so it's important to have this question because then we can make sure everyone is on the same page. And I will have a quick story on that. Um, two years ago, some, uh, we had like a, we have some ETL job running on Hadoop. And one of these jobs can take some hours, like it's passing a big amount of data and try to uh, uh, generate stats on that and push that to some database. Uh, Sometimes it could take like over an hour, uh, but there was like big discussion. Uh, every time it was going over three hours, we are getting like everyone freaking out. It's like, oh, it's unacceptable, uh, the customer are pissed and all that. And like, you guys need to react faster. It's like, well, we, we get page, we react, what, what's going on? I don't understand. And it's only when I started to, disc to talk with one of the sales guy, who explained to me like, no, the three hours, it's really like when the customer notices the issue and get pissed. Our paging system was based at three hours. So we get paged at after three hours uh, uh, latency on this uh, solution, uh, on this uh, process. But three hours was already too late, so customer noticed it. So we had to review our, our paging and our monitoring to get it back to, um, uh, okay. uh, to get it back to a reasonable timing. Uh, so uh, once we uh, reduce that to one and a half hour, we have like enough time to figure out the problem, fix it, and give like uh, enough notice to people. It's like, oh, we have a problem with this. Uh, we are going to have like a small outage or something like that, and we, we will exceed our SLA. So once we are able to understand better what is the real business need, we are able to answer like uh, uh, the problem better and give proper communication. Once we are able to say like, uh, this is going to happen, People don't freak out, they can uh, tell customer in advance. Uh, because of this, the kind of job it was, it's not a big deal if it goes over for uh, uh, one hour or two, but you need to tell the customer before they notice it. Um, and this, was, this is what we try to answer. Uh, it's really try to make sure that our monitoring is really in sync with the business, uh, because many times we have been like putting monitoring based on whatever the engineering team or even us thought it was smart. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily meet the, the business need. So to summarize, uh, we uh, easily automate our deployment across multiple geos. Um, we control the noise, so we reduce that with a check cluster and all that. Uh, we easily schedule our on-call rotation. Uh, in one location, we know everything. We have this on-call dashboard uh, that gives us all the information. And, uh, we know what is impacting uh, the business with this uh, service dashboard, and we, uh, uh, and we know how we should prioritize our action. So on our workflow, uh, on a daily basis, what it means is that for on-call, we have a, a Kanban dashboard. So we use Jira for all the engineering team. Um, so all those um, dashboard are uh, basically on developer request or sales complaint or whatever, we, we can create ticket, but we have also our service dashboard, we have our on-call dashboard, we have like a Nigeria's uh, paging system, uh, we have some uh, a graphite or, or a cost uh, uh, dashboard that will tell us if there's, we start to use more resources than what we should. Uh, based on all this information, we can create a ticket and prioritize them in, uh, in this uh, to-do. And whoever is on call can just take that and grab it and uh, get in progress and start to do some work. Your on call shift is done. You can move it back into do and someone else can take it, going top to bottom. And, um, and uh, we, we just have two swim lanes. Um, that's like project management forwarding. Uh, they love this one. Um, the, w the main swim lane is production support. So it's uh, high priority things. Whatever happened here, you are on call, it's what you need to focus on. Uh, you go top to bottom. Uh, 
it's when you are on, uh, it's for the on call 24/7. It's where we uh, we can uh, uh, open ticket for um, outage maintenance. Uh, on the outage, we can specify like which part of the infrastructure is uh, being impacted. Is, does it have a business uh, impact? Uh, the business impact information is really useful uh, for post analysis, but also to prioritize this list. Uh, and some of it is coming from this service uh, dashboard. If the service reports like some issues, we know there is customer impact, so the ticket must be a customer impact uh, impacting uh, ticket. Um, all the maintenance tickets are under second. We don't do maintenance if there is an outage going on. Uh, so we'll have to reschedule or we push them. And we have a second stream link that is a developer support. It's really, we have an engineering team of about like 40 people. Um, they are really smart, but it's also really demanding uh, because we have a small operation team compared to their size. And uh, we have to um, be able to answer like efficiently on how we give them the proper access, how we make sure they don't open like security or, or create like admin tools that allow you to uh, manage uh, all the EC2 instance and give the password to everyone, uh, things like that. We have to be on top of those things for security purpose, but uh, we have to be able to uh, understand like what they are trying to build. Uh, so there is a lot of requests coming there and we try to answer, or some of the requests are like, hey, we have this application running, it doesn't run as good as before. We need some help troubleshooting what's going on. And sometimes it will be like application rated, but they will need help to know like, okay, where do I get the graph? What is the process actually doing? Like, is it, so we will have to come here and do like some S3 trying to understand the network application and things like that. Um, this is like a, a best effort uh, swim lane. We, we, we try to do our best. We don't have like any uh, commitment or guarantee. Uh, we, we try to do our best. It's still the on-call person doing that. So there is a lot of things going on in production support. Well, unfortunately, we can't necessarily answer all the developer support requests. Um, complex ticket or long project. If someone asks us to uh, deploy like a new infrastructure, like uh, uh, I, one case we got one, uh, last month, I think it's someone opened a ticket there and tell us like, oh, I need um, I need a new clust elastic search cluster uh, for next week uh, because in three weeks I leave the company or something like that. It was an intern asking us that. We're like, uh, wait, <laughs> what are you trying to build and uh, what it is? I mean, we are not going to build like a new product and put it push it in production without knowing uh, like how it works and what it does. So we move that to our next uh, dash, um, project management uh, dashboard. Um, and it's a separate workflow. We have like, uh, we have this uh, checklist that we give to people and we ask them like, okay, what do you do? Uh, what is the purpose? What, uh, how does it work? What, what are you trying to accomplish? Many times, many times in the past, we lost time uh, trying to uh, just do what developers or engineering ask us. Like, oh, I need a SSH tunnel to that. Or I need access to this Hadoop cluster. Okay, we give you the access. Oh, it doesn't work. What's going on? Can you guys do your job? Well. <laughs> What are you trying to do? And when you understand, it's like, well, no, it's not going to work. You can't do that. Um, when you, you have like people trying to access like Hadoop cluster from one region, like US West, and your Hadoop cluster is in US East, well, the way Amazon is set up, you will return like private IP uh, when you contact the data node. So when your client try to reach, you will get the first contact, but then it gets a bunch of private IP and can't contact the rest of the data node. And this is where this checklist is helping us, is to make sure we understand what they are building. So we make sure the solution they suggest is going to work and is going to fit in all our infrastructure and, and match with the security rules. We'll have like backup policy and all that. So that's the first step, that's what we do. And we build epic story task based on that. Uh, so for this elastic search uh, things, we, we just went through a bunch of questions. Based on that, we were able to open all the proper tickets and make sure like, okay, we need to build doc documentation. We need to have a standard operating procedure for this. Uh, we need to have like backup procedure for that. And, and uh, all this get uh, in this uh, infrastructure planning dashboard where we can prioritize and say like, okay, we can do this here. We can put some effort. We can uh, deprioritize some project because this guy is leaving like in two weeks. We need to get it done. So uh, let's organize our effort and we can make sure that uh, everything gets managed the same way. There is a dashboard where 
You just worked up to bottom, you're assigned to some tickets, you work on it, you move it to in progress. When you are done, you move it to QA. When it's uh, QA, you can move it like it's done. Um, and that's pretty much our workflow. And on a, a twice a week, we try to revisit that. We try to see, like, OK, is there any bottleneck? Is there any blocker? Is there something that that not work? We check. And if there is an adjustment or change on priority, we can do that. Uh, and it's where it's all happened. So it's for m more complex and larger projects. So that's about it. So all that won't be possible without the amazing SRE team, our ops team uh, uh, I have. Uh, it's Ukraine and US, uh, mostly, mostly French people and Ukrainian people. Uh, but uh, that's how we make it. So that's it. Do we have any questions? Um, I really like the idea of kind of marrying like monitoring, you know, to the business side. But um, our my company has a lot of troubles getting the business people and the technical people, you know, getting along. Hmm. And it really sounds like. You know, doing this kind of thing, at least for my company, would require like another manager. You know, yeah. somebody who can both walk the walk and talk the talk with both teams. Yeah. Because my technical staff lacks social skills and my business staff lacks technical skills. Yeah. But we're short staffed all the time and we, we don't have somebody who can do this for us. That, yeah. And the thing is that I don't think there is a tool that will solve this problem. And, and it's really like a, um, um, yeah, it's a manager problem. I mean, Two years, three years ago, we had a lot of outage. We, we had these issues with this uh, alerts going on, and, and we were responding like really fast. We were like staying up all night trying to make sure everything works, and, and people were still complaining. And it's only when I walked to the salespeople and tried to understand, like, okay, what, what's up? What, what do you really need? When we understood that, we were like, okay, we need to redesign some part of the application because it just we, we just can't uh, meet the expectation of this, uh, what we commit to the customer. And, and, and we had to change some of our monitoring to be smarter and match what they need. And that's really like, if you don't have this communication, if you don't have someone that talk to this person, and I don't know if it's necessary like a operation team manager, manager could be like a, um, some other function that is, is in charge of that. I don't know how big well, is your company. How do you guys do it? Do you have one person who just acts as like an inner intermediary between I, as of today groups. I do feel it's part of my responsibility to make sure my team answer correctly to the business need so it's what I do I I, I go talk to the salespeople I go talk to uh, uh, when we have projects it's why we introduce this uh, checklist it's like okay we build a project we have product uh, manager involved in the project uh, cycle so product manager knows what they expect and what how they build the product what what the product should uh, uh, turn out so you c instead of salespeople, because they are not always like the best, they, they can bullshit you a little bit. So you, you, may <laughs> you, you may get like product manager involved. It's generally easier. They understand like some of the technical challenges and they know what they want to build. And they are here to tell you like, okay, this is what we are selling. This is what we are committing to, uh, to do. And this is what, the, what are the expectations. If you understand the expectation, you should be able to, uh, to build the proper monitoring around that. So product manager may be the best approach, uh, the easiest to talk with. Yeah. OK, thank you. Sure. All right, we are just running a little past time right now. But if you guys do have any questions, you can definitely talk to him after afterwards. I did want to remind you guys once again that we have Birds of the Feather running in track two during lunch. Uh, subject matter will be API, um, and Eric and Andy will be running that. So if we get a nice big round of applause for our presenter. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.